guys, I want to thank you very much for having me here. This is a delightful place. You guys are all fantastic people, and I've had a lot of fun. So anyway, I guess we better get going on the coloring. Um, coloring is something I've kind of been experimenting with a lot. Personally, I really like the bare metal with the um, shading caused by the scale. And this is hand sanded. It's not pickled in anything. Um, with hand sanding it, it leaves a scale in the lines and around the outside edges. And I think it makes a neat effect. After it was hand sanded with uh, 80 grit, right here sandpaper, and the red scotch bright. And if you're using the scotch bright, only get the 3M scotch bright. Don't think you're saving money getting the cheaper stuff because it is way too coarse and it'll make scratches all over your metal. So this, this is the way I prefer. Yes? Do you ever go to a finer scotch bright? I have on some things, but this is just, there's nothing more than the red on this. And you're not seeing the scratches. After I'm done doing the sanding, uh, I'll put the Brunel's water displacing oil on my work. I'll let it sit about 24 hours, wipe off any of the excess, and then I'll use the Renaissance wax. And I'll pass this around. You guys can look at it. Just when you're done looking, put the top back on so it doesn't get nasty. Um, this is used in the British museums on their armor. I think Dan said he uses it on his armor. Is that right? Is that you who told me that? Dwayne. OK. Somebody said, oh, I use that on my armor. It's great stuff. And it is. It's, it's really. Redhead. OK. It's really, really, really good stuff. So I guess I can pass. This stuff around, you guys can look at it. This is 12 gauge steel. It's just my plain old mild steel. The Renaissance wax you can put on with a brush or a soft cloth. When I am buffing my work, uh, I use a microfiber cloth. It's up there because it's, it's pretty much lint free. You don't want to use paper towel or sheet or anything like that and get a lot of lint on your work. It, it makes it look bad. The other things I've been experimenting with is because customers like color. So, you know, they're the ones that are going to buy your work. So I was experimenting with ways to color. And I think most of you are familiar with your oxidation colors. Um, I've had some people say, oh, but those will disappear after a time. They don't. Usually people have put the turpentine linseed oil, boiled linseed oil, Japan dryer on their work and then follow it with like Johnson's paste wax. It's the coating that discolors because I've done it on some of my work and it's all of a sudden turning darker and darker. The colors are disappearing. So I thought, what do I have to lose? I stripped everything off. The colors were still under there. So that's another reason for the Renaissance wax, is it does not discolor like your other finishes do. I have found out, though, that put your oil on, and it kind of perfect, protects the um, oxidation colors. If you just put the Renaissance wax on it, your blue will turn black. Don't know why. Don't know why it works, but it does. So, so far, are there any questions? about it. How do you feel about the Gilders? Gilders paste. That's a bad subject. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, called them, I called them to find out how light fast their colors were and you know how much testing they had done with it. And they said our metallic colors are light fast. Use the other ones and call us and let us know how they work. <laughs> so I can't put up with blatant honesty. 
It was blatant honesty, but they weren't paying me to experiment with my work, so I decided to try doing something else. Um, so I thought, well, you know, how would oil paints work? They work really well to a point, but, you know, I, I put my oil paints on, let it dry for a long period of time, then put wax over it. There's enough solvent in your waxes to take your oil paints off. And it was like, hmm, that's not working well for me. So Mark had been working on a gun stock and using boiled linseed oil. And uh, he was drying it in our oven. Our oven gets used for a lot more besides cooking. I mean, you have to open it up and make sure there's nothing in there before you actually preheat it for real food. Um, but I thought, well, what if I paint some metal with oil paint and put it in the oven, like at a very low temperature for a very long time, and then try putting my wax on? And it worked. It does something to the paint. I think it kind of hardens your your linseed oil or dries the linseed oil somehow, which wouldn't normally ever dry. And you can put your Renaissance wax on and it does not remove the paint. And this took a number of years to figure out. The other thing is, if you're interested in using the oil paint, there's a company called Dick Blick. And I called them about oil paints because you have to check on the light fastness of your paints also. And they said, hey, go to our website. Go to a part called Artist Oil Paints. We have a whole chart as to whether the paint is, they call it transparent or opaque. They grade the pigments and they grade the light fastness. So if you're thinking of using oil paints, Go to that website. It has all the research is done. You don't have to do it with your work, which I thought was, was really great. Um, it's Dick Blick. I can pass this around. You guys want to look at it? There's also, besides your, your they call it the artist oil colors, and they're student grade. Use the artist oil colors because the pigments are a lot better in the artist oil colors. And you can call this company. They're really willing to work with you and tell you everything they know about it. And they were telling me, yeah, there's a student grade and there's the professional grade. They said, for what you're doing, get the professional grade. Much better quality paints. Um, the other thing is, is on the Grumbacher, it has the first paragraph. It says, transparent, light fastness, excellent. And if you're using these paints, that's kind of what you want. Uh, I can pass these around. I'll keep the red, because that's what I'm going to use for, for my demo. Do you have a food safe finish that you use? When I'm using things for coloring for food, um, I don't really color for food, because I don't think there really is a food safe one. This stuff, definitely not. Yeah. Uh, if you want to make a really neat brown color on something, you know, like mild steel for food, try walnut oil. You can get it um, in the salad part of a grocery store, you know, where all the salad dressings are. And walnut oil is excellent on metal and on wood. And the same thing with, with um, the walnut oil. I just put it in the oven for a long period of time. And it makes a really neat, very hard brown color on your metal. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful color. And on wood, it makes a beautiful finish. It's a drying oil. So it's, it's but as far as any of this stuff, oh no, I would not put it in my mouth because this stuff is nasty. Um, pass these around. This one I did before I knew 
or realize the difference between the opaque and the transparent colors. And the colors are a little bit muddy. This one is sap green. I thought, well, you know, I really like the sap green color. What's the difference? So I started reading the back. Ah, transparent or semi-transparent. That's what you want to give a finish more like this. You can almost see the metal through it. Your, your direction. So this, this is the one that has like the opaque colors. This is the one that has the transparent or semi-transparent colors. And I like the transparent or semi-transparent a lot. Boop, that way. Okay, opaque, transparent, okay? And just kind of hold them by the edge. Actually, I made these, these are fish hooks. So you can put them on a wall and hang things from them. The other way that I color metal is with my oxidation colors in a torch. And the other one is, I think you're all familiar with, is using a brass brush in heat. And they all turn out pretty cool. So the first one I'll do since we have to put it in an oven for about five hours. So I'll make the mess first. This is a leaf that I'm gonna color. It's a maple leaf. If you're making leaves, the, the easy way to get patterns is go outside and pick up a leaf. Trace around the outside of it. Draw just the main veins on. Don't put all the other little veins in. You know, all you need to do is suggest this. When I'm doing this, none of my veins touch each other. If they do, when you go to, you know, um, poofing it out, giving it some contour, you get ugly, crimp-looking spots. So just, just leave that, that little space. And usually if you don't tell somebody, they don't even notice it. Yes, well, the fish are not sandblasted. They're, they're pickled in um, white vinegar to remove the scale. And then I neutralize all that with baking soda. How long do you pickle something like that? Until it's clean. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually overnight. And then I just rub it with the scotch Brite to, to clean off all the the residue, and then wash it off real well, put it in baking soda to neutralize everything. How do you decide which you're going to pickle and which you're going to have Okay, this, this I would not pickle because this stem is rolled. And I think if, if I do that and get that moisture down in there, it might be a way for it to rust. Right. Can't, get it so, can't get it out. So I don't do that. But anything that's flat and doesn't have any undercutting, I'll go ahead and, and pickle it. You know, unless I'm doing it and want to leave bare metal or want to use my scale as part of my coloring or shadowing, then I don't pickle. So th there's not that many things that I pickle. The leaves, to color them, they get sandblasted because it, it, it just, created a really cool color and what well, kind of a textured surface to something that would, would otherwise be just plain flat. When you sandblast what media do you use? Just something to sand and you're not supposed to use. <laughs> we have an OSHA unapproved shop. <laughs> totally. You can buy garnet sand fairly easily and that's side of free. Yeah. Okay, I just, and you know, parts of old refrigerators are wonderful for doing this. And this is a fairly soft brush. It's gonna be a mess. What I'll do is I'll do the back first and just get it on there and really scrub it in. And if, if 
if your spouse or significant other has um, oil paints and paint brushes, don't take their brushes because they'll kill you because I mutilate the brushes. So that'd be a good grandkid project right there. You don't want them getting this on their hands, really. Some of these paints have some pretty toxic things in them. So I would, I would not turn a grandkid loose uh, with, with any of this. It's kind of, you know, like the lead and the EPA and, and all those things. Um, I, had, I had a run in with, with the EPA at the Illinois State Fair and then with the fire marshal. And, and I told them that I was pretty old already, so, you know. Because they told me, you know what people like you guys die from? I said, what? You guys die from emphysema. I said, really? Well, I'm already old, so, you know, maybe I'm safe on this one. And I also got called indigent one day because we were at a wine tasting and demonstrating blacksmithing and just unloaded a coal forge and set it all up, and I was absolutely filthy dirty. And Mark said, well, why don't you go get us a, you know, a sample of wine? They gave us tickets. We can sample the wine. It's kind of slow here. And the lady said, I'm sorry, but I don't serve the indigent. I said, what? She said, you know, homeless people like you. I will <laughs> not serve them wine. I laughed. I thought it was funny. <laughs> so I went somewhere else and got a taste. But it, it, it was, it was just comical. Well, she was a very elderly, prim, proper old lady with her blue-gray bun on top of her head and everything. And, but the funny part about it is this place was, it was in Rend Lake and it's, it's the Illinois Artisan Shop is where it was, and it's out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's like, I'm thinking, I would have walked maybe 10 miles for a thimble full of wine if I was a wino, and yeah. She, she, did, she did come and apologize to me afterwards, but it was like... And she said, you know, and I think the most insulting part was her thinking that I didn't know what indigent was. It's <laughs> like, like, okay. So I'll paint the back of this first in case I ding any of the paint off. This side is not as, as, uh, if it's got a little mark on it, I'm not as concerned because people aren't going to leave this side up. And I started making leaves because I really wanted to make a um, sculpture. And I've never had the sculpture made because people buy the leaves like this just to set out on tables. They attach them to walls. I don't know what they do, but they buy leaves. So now we'll do the front. And obviously, I can't pass this around after it's done. So if you guys want to come up afterwards and look at it, and then it's going into an oven. And the way all this started is the, the fish wall hanging that um, is in the gallery. That was in a gallery in Illinois. And somebody spilled, it looked like coffee with a lot of cream in it all over the front of the piece during a show. And I kind of looked at it and thought, you know, what am I going to do with this? Thought, you know, what, what will it hurt to clean it off, strip all the finish off, um, and play with it? And that's, that was my experimental piece with this painting technique. Try and get all your edges. 
and you put on a thin coat. I'm really trying to, to make this paint go as far as I can. Obviously, I squished too much out of the tube. That's, that's clear this is the this is the trans semi transparent. Oh, and when you when you bake it, that's when it becomes transparent. It this is it'll be sort of like this. Oh, okay. And the color I found it's experimenting with the colors. Yellow is the absolute worst color to use because for some weird reason when you put it on on the metal it almost turns a green color. If you're doing this, like say you wanted to put green and red, put the green on first and then the red and you can, you can blend the red into the green and it makes a really, really neat effect. So why do you say put the green on? I don't know why. I was, just, I was playing with it one day and I, I figured out that it, it blends better that way for some reason. This is all, you know, play with it and... See how it works is the best thing to do. That kind of sounds like the uh, Gilder's Paste people, doesn't it? <laughs> but like I say, this is just, just totally, totally, for me, experimental doing this. And it was mainly because a gallery pretty much trashed a piece of my work that this came about. I haven't. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I've been pretty happy with the colors I've gotten just straight out of the the tubes. Except, you know, um, the thing I've experimented with is like. Uh, here's another blue. Your cobalt blues and stuff are too intense. They don't work right. So I've, I guess my experiments have been, OK, what colors are going to work the best on the metal? They might work fabulously on, on a canvas, but really stink when you put it on metal. So that's been the extent of, of what I've been experimenting with. And I imagine, like, I think on, on the one fish where I used the opaque colors, I had blended a bunch of colors. And I was not happy with what I was getting. Because they were, and I think it was mainly because they were opaque more than anything, that they, they covered the metal way too much. This, this is literally, sorry guys, like watching paint dry. It's pretty bad. Now, I thought the Gilder's Paste was really a cool idea, and I do have Gilder's Paste, and I've not been, not been real pleased with it. With the Gilder's Paste. And I did. I questioned, okay, it's a wax, so what's going to happen if it's in... You know, your real bright sunlight, is it going to soften the wax? Or is, it, is there something in there that, that makes that really hard enough that it doesn't soften? And we're just going to do one color on this one. Yeah, on the Gilder's paste, you have to put clear coat over it. On this, I just, I have a, a leaf at home that I just tried clear coating. It looks fine. Um, I'm just going to sit on it for a while and see, see how it works. But uh, there aren't any clear coats that are really UV. Probably not. So, but this paint is supposed to be. And my work, um, 
is interior work. So this is what we have. How do you want? I'll just try to work in the back. Oops. <laughs> I'm going to make you seasick up there. <laughs> <laughs> Play with the cameraman. <laughs> okay, and now this goes into the oven. Have you experimented with um, textural painting on this? I haven't. No. no. I don't know how it would adhere, how well it would adhere to it. Like I say, this is all play with it. Okay, it's over here. Yes. Yeah, it's just a 250 degree onion oven. For five hours? For about five hours, yeah. And that just sets the oil? Does something chemically, I, I don't know. Do you have any ideas what it would be doing? I have, I have. Why heating the, the oil paint would make it so a solvent doesn't take it off? Because you probably cook all of the solvent out of it. Well, but the wax has a solvent in it. And the wax is what will remove your paint. But it's not the wax that's removing your paint. No, it's the solvents that are in the wax, yeah. So by baking this, it does something to the paint that the solvents will not... Probably cure the... The linseed oil. Or well, it's, it's the resins. Okay. You've, you've cured the resins, and they are no longer uh, susceptible. You know, there's, there's resins in paint. Yeah. Paint, paint is a two-part process. Okay, how does it's this open? Pigment and resin. Okay. The resin holds the pigment, and the pigment protects the resin. I don't off, want to get. You know, the white paint rubs off on your hand after yeah. years because all of the resin at the surface has gone bad, and the white pigment it comes off and exposes mm -hmm. fresh resin underneath. Yeah. And eventually, it all just wears away. But uh, once the resin has cured, it, it's not liquid anymore. Yeah. You can't, you know, you can't put water on dried latex paint. Yeah. Because that resin has. Sure. Is, does anybody know, is there a couple of really small pieces of round stock or something that I could put on in there and set it on so I don't get any paint in his oven? And it probably wouldn't hurt anything, but... Put it in there. I don't care. You don't care? I'm you on the TV. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't want to ruin the bottom of your oven. No. That's okay. why this is here. Okay. I suddenly heard you talking. I went, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. I don't care. Oops. Uh, that'll yeah, no, it's, he said it's okay. Oh, no, I see, look at your mess. I'm going to have to wipe my hands off before I go further. Here. <laughs> About the coloring I put on there? I, I'll, pa I'll pass it all around. Yeah, with the name and, of it. It's a cool red. It is a, a fantastic it like, red. It looks like a maple like in the fall. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah, it, it really turns out cool. Is this anybody's rag? Okay. <laughs> it's mine now. Mark's looking like, oh my gosh. Yeah, nobody will notice. It doesn't show. Uh, the fact that I had a piece of work, work that's in there, in a gallery, and it, it was just, you know, I, I had the brass brush and coloring the things, and somebody at a gallery opening spilled gooey stuff all over the front of my work. Did they then buy it? Did they what? Did they then buy it? No. No, and this is why my work's no longer in that gallery, because... She didn't offer to pay for any of the damages. Um, I took my work back 
it was a mess. And I was like, okay, this is a mess. I'm going to have to totally strip the wax finish off. And I used lacquer thinner to do that. Yes. Sanded it back down. And um, started playing with the oil paints. And that's how I found out that, okay, you know, I thought I had left it long enough for the paint to have sort of dried. And I put Renaissance wax on it. And it took the paint off. And then I had more of a mess. So we went through the sanding again, cleaning everything up. And that's when I thought, OK, um, we're going to try baking it in the oven after you recolor it. And that's how that came about. Yeah. And it was all because, and I've never told this gallery owner, hey, you really helped me out by destroying a piece of my work. Um, we just let that one slide. and. OK, I'll pass the paint around. And you can, if you want to write down the names of these colors, these are the colors that so far have worked really well for me. Do you want me to hold them up for you? You're tired of me making you seasick? Yep. <laughs> OK, the next, the next way to color a leaf, and here's a little oak leaf, is I need an extension cord with a brass brush. And I, you guys are probably all familiar with the brass brush, the heat, that whole routine. And whoever doesn't have safety glasses on, please put safety glasses on. Even if you have regular glasses. Good way to treat them. Yeah. The brass brush, always use it on the absolute lowest speed because those little bristles break off and it feels like you've been playing with a very angry porcupine. And that's what I told them last night. Is then I take my clothes home and throw them in the washing machine with his t-shirts and stuff. There are many days he's not happy. OK, I just, this is pretty much just out of the forge with the scale on it. And again, I would not pickle it because I don't want it to start rusting down inside there. So I'll just clean off as much of the scale as I can. And the other thing, when, when you're doing stuff like this, you're going to have failures. Don't be afraid of a failure. You know, how are you going to learn unless you push the envelope? What I'm doing is just cleaning off some of the scale. I've also used this as a color for the leaves. And this is the extent of the power tools I ever use as a Dremel. I don't use anything else. Everything else is done by hand.
So try and get into all the little nooks and crannies of this thing. So this is what I have now. I've done the front and the back. So Yeah, it's a little steel brush to clean it up and you might as well light the torch. And I forgot my lighter for the torch, so Mark gets to be in control of the fire. I put my Kevlar gloves, there they are. Your oil paints are expensive, um, but get good quality. You know, don't, don't try and skimp on some of this stuff. Okay, I'm just gonna warm this up a little bit. and just on the absolute lowest speed. I try not to get into the veins too much because I kind of like them looking darker. You want to get this on as evenly as you can so you don't have any streaks. And if, if you use a brass brush, I found out like, okay, I could kind of quit at this stage or I can keep putting more in layers and more heat and you can get lighter and darker colors of, of the brass. You know, it, it hasn't seemed to.
You know, you can you have automotive paints, you have a whole bunch of things, but automotive paints are so toxic, I don't want anything to do with them. Okay, so you can see the it's kind of faintly brass colored. Right. So I'll just use the torch. If you get it too hot, you can burn it off. So you kind of have to watch what's happening. Dick Wick is really good on shipping. Um, you know, I can call him and, and within a couple days you can have your stuff. You can also get the paints like, I don't know, you guys have Hobby Lobby and Michaels and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can get them at those stores or different art stores. Yep, you want to come up here and look? It's, it's making it a, a deeper color. Now, what? Yeah, it's, it's just brass brush. So it's just with the brush? Yep, it's just with the brush, and if you're real careful, I'll do it again. And you can just put like layers on it to make it darker. See how dark, much darker it's getting right there? So the heat is keeping the veins open? No, not the heat. Is I'm, I'm trying not to get into the veins with the brass. So you kind of could control it just a little bit. It, it just, it won't get very dark. It probably wouldn't stay real well. I think it kind of, what makes it adhere better. Like I say, I'm not the technical one. Pardon? I've seen the brass brush and heard about doing that. Um, the Dremel, that was kind of my idea, is you can get so much more brass onto the piece with this Dremel, and I think part of it is the speed. You can actually see the brass kind of powdering. So you can see it's getting a darker brass color. Okay, so I'm gonna put more heat on it. No, I haven't. That'd be cool to do. Be cool to play with. Pardon? Yeah. I can hardly hear you with this. So, um, since I can't hear people, if they have questions, maybe later on come up and ask me. You can also get, if you do it, kind of catch it just right, you can get some of your oxidation colors showing through from underneath. And I have a feather that I did, and it depends on the angle of the light. You get purples in it and blues in it and the gold color. And I probably should have brought that with me, right? What? Uh, no, it was kind of intentional.
Yeah. OK, so this is what we have. That's the back. Oops. OK, I'm going to set this over here and let it cool off. Yep. We used to sell a lot through our shop. But unfortunately, we have a very lax police department in our town that doesn't really see any reason to really enforce laws like people doing vandalism and breaking windows out. So when I do my work, my work is out of that shop. I don't leave it in there anymore. I mean, when you go to your shop one morning and you have six windows broke out, a week later you have three more windows broke out. And this is happening all over town. And they haven't gained access so far to our building, but they have to others. And it, it's vandalism. And you call the police department, and they say, oh, we don't do anything about stuff like that. It's like, I went off on this police officer. We'll put it that way. And Mark's thinking, you know, maybe you should shut up, because I think you're going to go to jail <laughs> if you don't. I ask him, blank, what the blank do you do? <laughs> And it went on from there. <laughs> it was a tirade. I was, I was, when we bought the building, it had 27 broken windows in it. It, it, it was, it's, was built in 1928 around a blacksmith shop that had been there since 1892, as far back as we have researched. Um, the building we have was called the Biltright Factory. And he had, you know, the great big old factory type windows in it. And he was doing horseshoeing, repair work for farmers and for the community. And in the back of the building, he was building truck bodies and trailers for Model A's. It was considered the most important building and business in that community at the time because it was the only one to employ other people. However, I mean, it was a booming community at one time. How many grocery stores did they have? Three or four. Yeah, and a number of blacksmiths. But it, it seems as if they built the interstate. The interstate killed our town. We're right on one of the exits. And then they built. A city manager we had thought it'd be great to have a rest area outside our community. What was he thinking? They didn't have to go off to use the bathroom or get something to eat or drink now. They went right on by. I mean, they, they killed it. So the community is kind of having, unfortunately, a downhill spiral. However, we're there now. I mean, we've been there. But we have two very good glass blowers in our community now. So hopefully we can get more artists and maybe that way turn the town around. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, Paducah, Kentucky. But Paducah had a huge problem with, with crime in what they called Lower Town. Well, they had one bank that had you know, most of the mortgages for the slumlords. And what they did is they passed an ordinance. If you rented property, it had to be inspected by the fire department and the police department once a year. So guess who left? All their renters who were doing drugs and other activities in the buildings, they left. And they started a program where they made low interest loans for artists. Artists could use the downstairs of the houses as their, their shops or galleries. They could live in the back of it or upstairs. Um, they gave them other perks, low interest loans for vehicles, et cetera. They turned their community around doing that. Um, it's, it's very well known. They have lots of, of bus tours, tours coming in. Um, they've created something that's, that's really cool. 
So, you know, maybe there's hope for Farmer City. I hope it's so. It it's, has the potential to come back and be a good community again. But it's, it's the drug people and other people that have come in because they, they can and there's no consequences. And I think that's true pretty much of our whole county in a way. Um, there's no consequences. It's like guys get into fights. It's like, do you want to empty your pockets before we take you to jail? Is there any incriminating stuff in your pockets? Maybe you should dump your stuff here. It's like, really? <laughs> but so, yeah, I, we try and get our stuff out or do commission work. Anyway, I have a, whoops, have a feather that I made. And I'm going to show you how to use your oxidation colors in your brass brush in the bare metal all in one project. I don't think, if I came closer, could you see all the lines in it? A little bit. Okay. Yeah, real still. <laughs> no coffee for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And it's got a lot of scale and stuff on it, so I'm going to try and get all that off. And again, I'm using my Dremel and a little wire brush. And it takes a little bit of cleaning. Pardon? you have a banner in your shop that says Mindy for Mayor? No. We live, I have been asked to run for mayor, but we do not live inside the city limits. So, absolutely not. Pardon? They probably want marijuana leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in Illinois, it's not legal <laughs> yet. I mean, why bother making it legal? They don't do anything about it. It's, you know. You know, the community is also a community that's it's very conservative. The older people there are older farmers and stuff. And they've come into our shop and say, well, gee, that's really pretty, but what would you do with it? It's not utilitarian. So, you know, there's the kids in that community in school, like I was talking, talking to Julie about their art program here, which is fabulous. In Farmer City, they get a quarter of a semester of art for a half hour. That's it. Until they get to high school. Well, by then, it's really too late to expose them to a lot and to teach them a lot. So it's artistically, the area that we live in is, is pretty backwards, which is, is really sad because there are a lot of kids falling through the cracks that are artistic that are not getting a chance. You know, art, art is the first thing that seems to get cut. That's so why I'm looking around here thinking, gosh, would I like to have been here in high school? Wouldn't that have been great? For doing a feather, I'm going to use my oxidation colors. Your fluorescent lights 
really play horrible games with you. So I don't know how, how good we're going to do at this. And the interesting thing is, is on this feather, you know, sometimes on some, some of your work, your solid pieces that don't have all these lines, you have a lot more control than you do with the, uh, all these little lines. It really heats up very quickly. It goes through the colors immediately. Okay, this is what it looks like. Just cleaned up as I can get it right now. Hang on, coming in. That's great. Hey, I did something right for you. I'm so happy. <laughs> it's the first time since I've been here. Cut, cut back on coffee rations. I don't even drink coffee. <laughs> if I do, it's decaf. I don't do caffeine. Okay, so we'll go to the brass brush. And the, the thing is, is, is I can use that um, steel brush kind of like an eraser. So if I get colors where I don't want, I'll use that and get them back off. And I do have a, a feather out in the van that I colored. It's made out of aluminum, and we can pass that around, and everybody can, can touch it and play with it. And then I need my, does anybody have a lighter? <laughs> if I can get my thumb to do this. What I usually do is I just turn this on. And then come up from the back. Oops, I got on too. Watch me burn my finger. I just come up from the back, and it usually works the first time every time. Okay. I think this is going to be really hard to see. But I want to keep the tip of this kind of the steel color and make a blue line through there. can't see that well here. That helps. Can you see it? It's kind of a straw colored right now. It's turning brown. I have a color chart if somebody wants to go in that thing of books, the brown box. And in one of those scrapbooks, there's a color chart. And what I do with this is, is I stop just like right before the color that I want because it'll keep heating up a little bit. 
And I used to color my fish just using the oxidation colors. And I thought, wow, I can get some cool colors with oil paints. So I started doing that. Pardon? No, I'm doing my coloring and then I'll do the brass. Pardon? Yes, I was, I was using a steel brush. Let's see, this is purple. The ornament that I did for the White House, this is how I colored the entire ornament. Okay. Now you can see... Back up. That's good. That's okay, good. cool. Right, what I'll do now is where I want the brass color to be since this is still kind of warm. I'll try and go right below it and try not to get on the shaft of the feather. I'll do the other side here. A little bit. At home I have a, a workbench with a lot of sort of natural light bulb type lights and you can see a whole bunch better. And then very carefully I'll heat this brass because I don't want to lose those oxidation colors. You know what, I'm going to get done ahead of time.
And this is what we have so far. Oh, now I got to figure out how to turn it for you. Thank you. Okay. Then what I'll do is put the steel brush back in and Clean up. Yeah. And sometimes you're doing gun blowing. You always do the gun blowing after. Yes. The gun gun blowing was the absolute last step. Okay. Because okay, then I would put the water displacing oil on it and let it sit for a while. Yeah. That's that's always the last. Yep. And like with this. I'll do my oxidation colors first, and then I'll use the brass brush afterwards. Because if, if I you know, want to get it, some colors it's, are, what, I forgot how many degrees. But you can kind of burn off some of the brass, too, if you get it too hot. OK, safety glasses again. Bummer. I don't know how hot that is. So what I'm going to do is where I don't want the dark color, the, the purplish color, I'm going to take it off or try to take off a lot of it. So where I want it to appear as if like the feather would be white, I'll take off the colors that I've applied. And that's usually pretty much the last step that I do. Playing with aluminum, the feather turned out pretty good. I, I could not get as much detail, sharp detail, as I got in the steel. Uh, and then to color it, I, I painted it. I didn't do a real good job on that because it was just totally goofing around to see how it worked. But like I say, we have a lot of aluminum. Um, I've been making like salad servers that look like leaves. And I did a test piece in aluminum first. thing, you know, going back to the oil paint, when you use your translucent paints, you can see the texturing of the metal, whereas the opaque just obliterates it. And I like to be able to see like the scale pattern and the textures of the metal. I think it's more attractive.
Okay, and that's how you use the, those colors. Thank you. And you can do, um, like I said, I've, I've done pheasant feathers and turkey feathers, you know, huge feathers, and colored them all like this. It, it works the best. I believe that when you use your oil paints, kinds of fills in, in the lines, and you, you can't see them as well as you can with, with the brass. And if you do get the heat right, you can get unbelievable, unbelievable color that when you, you tip it um, in different directions, you, you're getting the oxidation colors showing through the brass. It's, it's pretty phenomenal, the colors that they'll turn. Okay, and then after this, and I better give you, okay, who's lighter? He's gone. Okay, leave it there. Um, now I'll use this stuff. Uh, found out, keep it kind of in a warm environment, like our shop is really cold in the winter, and this stuff kind of solidifies. So it's one of the things that has to go out of our shop. Our shop in the winter time is like 35 degrees. It's pretty miserable. And the gas company really loves the place. I'm just going to try and pour a little bit, oops, on the table. Um, pardon? Yeah, my red rag. You know, I might soak it up off the table and put it on here, too. So I just use cheap brushes to put this on. And we get these from McMaster's. There's some in here. And you'll see the colors change somewhat. I try and dribble it down the quill. And you can see it's making the blue, purple. You can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've played games with you all weekend, haven't I? I know, I know, and you gave me a big lecture about it. <laughs> really? I'm scared. Okay. So just put your paint on, or not paint, but your water displacing oil on. Maybe I can walk around with it. I don't think you guys want this on your fingers. <coughs> Show you guys first. So you leave that on for about a day and then wipe it off? Yeah, so because we're here, I'll later on before your auction, I'll wipe it off. And Why put, do you do this and not just straight Renaissance wax? Or something because like the Renaissance wax will just play with those colors. Right. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why, but it, but it does. It, and I couldn't see the colors real well. I didn't get as blue as I would like to have. Yes. And I put just plain Renaissance wax on it. I guess I haven't looked at it lately. But it I didn't it, it, it kind of mutes the colors a little bit. Okay. Um, this seems to keep the colors better. Okay. So this is what I'm doing now. Yeah. It works well. OK, so let's hold it up, and you guys can see what it looks like. That's pretty neat. Thank you. This probably also causes cancer in California. If you're from any other state, you're entirely safe. <laughs> it'll, it'll somewhat dry, and then I'll wipe the residue off, and then I'll put my Renaissance wax on. Can you do your oil paints? Pardon? When you're baking your oil paints? Yeah, it's, it's 225. 225 works works well for a very long period of time. So, 
I do it about at least five hours. Sometimes I forget to turn the oven on and it stays on overnight. It doesn't hurt it. <laughs> then you wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh God, the, sh <laughs> the oven's on up at the shop. <laughs> what is the water displacing oil doing? Well, it, it, it prevents, it prevents rust, but it also helps maintain the colors better. We made one last night. What did it take? How long did it take to make that feather last night? A couple hours? And that was not working on it full time. It was handing it around and stuff. So um, you can kick out a feather like this for this technique fairly quickly using a treadle hammer. Yeah, that's, that's what makes a huge difference is a treadle hammer and how fast you can do this. And you can get that final work on the treadle? Yes, all my work is done on a treadle hammer. The way I got into doing this is because I had such bad tendonitis that, and I was training racehorses, standard bred racehorses, and driving them, and they pull tremendously hard. I mean, they're, you know, I would use my whole body to hold them. And kind of before that, I've had tendonitis in my elbows since I was 17. And some of it was doing horses, bailing hay, doing all that kind of stuff. Because yeah. yeah. my job was always riding the rack wagon and pulling the bales off the baler. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, but it got to a point where if you touched my hand, it hurt all the way up into my arm. And they said, you're going to lose the use of your arms unless you find a different profession. Well, that was kind of a sad day. So that's how I got into dispatching for 911. And that was, that was a yucky job. Um, I was so happy when Mark and I got our shop. And that brings another story as to why we got married. Because we'd been living together, quote, in sin for a number of years because both of us had had bad marriages. And we saw, went and looked at the blacksmith shop to see how they did the chimneys and see how they did everything. And I really wanted that shop because it was really cool. You could set it back up to be a blacksmith shop. So I talked to the building owner and they would be willing to sell it if they had a place to store their furniture because they're using it as a furniture warehouse. With 70 years of soot in it, I can't imagine, but they were. Um, so when I talked to the bank, they said, well, to give you a loan, we really prefer that you guys were married. <laughs> so we got married. <laughs> so we could get a blacksmith shop. It's a good a reason as any, right? It's a better reason. So I went back into the bank the next day. The guy goes, have you taken care of that little problem? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> we did. So, <laughs> you can really say you forged a marriage, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, bad. <laughs> but yes, that's, that's how that came about. And we restored the shop. Right now, it's a good candidate for the National Register. But until we can get rid of the people who punch our windows out, I'm not going to do it because one of the things is you have to re repair it with old materials. Where am I going to find that old glass? I can't. I mean, it would be. OK. You're shaking your head no. Evidently, you've had an experience. Uh, I, my property is on the National Register, and they don't care what I do. It's only if you're in a historic district. OK. Yeah, we're not in a historic district. We're in the slums. Historic district, uh, the district may have rules. Yeah. As far as uh, we're on the National Register of Historic Places, and I can do anything I want. Cool. Because then if we can do that, I would go ahead and do it to preserve the building. Because it's a cool building. Yeah, you should see what he's done to his barn. Really cool? <laughs> and I guess they're happier with you if you take it and turn the property into what it used to be. Because we've turned this back into a functioning blacksmith shop. And then they wanted us to be a museum, and it was like, no, I don't think so, because I don't want people coming through all the time.
because it disrupts your work. Anyway, I'm going to have to put this somewhere and let it dry. So anybody have a good idea? Where do you want me to put it? So Your pocket will do? <laughs> I think you want me to get this goo off of it first. Is anybody using that table over there for anything? Or is it OK to set it over there? Yeah, that would work. Like I say, parts of refrigerators. Um, He complains so much about taking stuff for the shop. It's just take the beer out, put the stuff. Put yeah, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> we put our stuff in the oven and the refrigerator and all over the house, and it's like, um, sorry, honey, but this is the way it is right now. Um, so, are there any questions on coloring, at all? No. Yes? No? no? <laughs> OK. Any questions on how to come up with designs or drawings? Well, you can transfer the talent over any time. <laughs> oh, thank you. I've, I've tried to do that to my <laughs> granddaughter, but it hasn't worked yet. Osmosis doesn't work. No, <laughs> osmosis doesn't work. You take a lot of pictures and, and get, uh, uh, make drawings from those. Yes. That's a, a good point. Um, my cell phone is pretty much overloaded with photographs. If you go outside and you see a really neat flower or plant, take lots of pictures of it. Use it as your model. Um, this piece. A lady came into the shop one day and she said, oh, look at the cool flower I just picked. And this was it. It was a moonflower and it was dying. It was closing up and it was actually wilting. So I stuck it in a, probably a pipe or something we had sitting around and put it on my table and started drawing it. That's how this idea came around. Um, nature offers tons and tons of ideas for you. I found a good way to take pictures of flowers is to take them at night with your cell phone camera. You can sh with flash, uh, flash does help. And actually, I've told Mark, hey, come on outside with me. We're going to use a flashlight, flash a flashlight on it. Tell them to turn the flashlight off after I've got my camera positioned. Take your picture. Let's see. We can, we can pass the cell phone around. Uh, I had some books. No moonlight or anything. Oh, moonlight doesn't hurt. I'm not going to limit myself that much as to you know, how's it and when's I can do things. Um, Here is a picture of flowers at night just using a flash. Oops. Very nice. And it works well. You see all the detail. You don't have all the garbage in the background. So it's a good way, especially you know, where we live, where in the wintertime there's nothing but ice, snow, mud, floods. You, you don't have anything to use as, as models for your work. So our computer, I think, is overloaded. My phone is overloaded. <laughs> you don't even know how to know. <laughs> the flash, with a black background, with the flash, it makes everything really pop. It makes all the detail show pretty good. I found out that your yellows don't work too well for some reason, and they reflect back. Um, let me get some of these books out, and we can talk a little bit about design.
Let's see if I can find the one book that I want to find. And it's in the van. It's in the front seat of the van, that mustard seed garden thing. Oops. Something just happened to that. Oh. Rot row. I think I lost parts. Can you just clip it on my jacket? Yeah, don't put your hand in my pocket. <laughs> Somebody did that. It was in Indiana when I was demonstrating. And this guy, he put safety pins and everything else all over me, and I had bibs on. I had to go potty, and I couldn't get out of this thing. <laughs> so I was ripping it all off, and I kind of got it off so I could go. And when I came back, this was not attached anymore. So he comes up to me without saying anything. He sticks his hand in my pocket. I said, hey, get your hands out of my pants. And this guy about died. <laughs> he, he, he totally freaked on me. OK, ideas. Like some of you say, hey, I can't draw. Dover books, and I don't, I don't think this is one of them. They have excellent line drawings. This is actually a coloring book for kids can kind of give you an idea of how few lines you have to use to do this kind of work. They're excellent idea books. Um, they also have books that are copyright free, so you can use their stuff. I think they ask that you don't sell it and make a big profit off of their uncopyrighted designs. So it's pretty much what I do for my ideas. It's just line drawings. And they also have Audubon's Birds of America coloring book. Look at those. Those would be perfect to give you thoughts on how to do this and how to do the lines. Yes. Yes, it's a Dover book. Nice, thank you. you can go to their website. Um, pass these around. The Oriental. Oh, did did we pass this around? Okay. Um, Oriental art is fantastic for doing this because it's, it's very simplified. So this is Chinese painting techniques. But, so you guys have to kind of study art a little bit. Uh, let me find. Look at that. The anatomy of a bird, the feathers, how they work. When you're doing things, if you want to simplify, blah, simplify to just suggest things, it helps to know pretty detailed the anatomy of an animal, how, a, um, how they work, the muscles, the leaves, where the veins are, what you can take out and what you need to keep to get the idea across is really important. Here's doing a fish. Shows how a fish moves on this. Wait, wait a minute. Right. Oops. Right there. The cool thing about doing fish is you have that the body that's pretty strong, and then you have these really delicate <coughs> fins and tail, and they're they're just fun to do. Oh, do you want the cover of this? Got it. Okay. This is another Dover book that I have, and it's been used a lot. The cover's gone. I think you have this one. It's what Atlas of Animal Anatomy for the Artist, I believe. Yes, Atlas of Animal Anatomy for Artists.
And like if you're wanting to do an animal, really helps to know where the muscles are, the hair patterns, we talked about that the other day. This, this book is a wealth of information on all of that. Your hair patterns on a dog. I did a dog, um, the glass blower in Farmer City wanted me to do their dog for his mom. And I traded a beautiful piece of art glass for, for my work. I, I do believe in the barter system. Um, doing the dog's nose and getting the perspective of the nose was really hard. I use that book a lot. I also use my poor dog. She's getting her muzzle grabbed and like, let me look at your nose. <laughs> you know? But it, it turned out pretty well. Um, this is another excellent book. It's kind of a strange book. But it's, it's doing grass. That was one of the harder things to do, is how to make that twist in grass. Uh, this has got really good pictures of, of how it was, it was done drawing-wise. And how gracefully it curves. So what I did to do it is I, um, you know, you can make your blade of grass and where it turns, I very carefully used my butcher and on either side of where I wanted, you know, had the, the turn in it, I made a little line, a little raised line, and then went back to a wider part, and it worked. Oh, sorry. Okay. And I, I have other books in here. Uh, these two books, and I think they're also Dover books. Are really good, like they're old um, engravings and etchings. Oh, sorry. You only have to tolerate me for a little bit more. <laughs> uh, it shows the shadowing using lines. So you see, there's, there's no straight line defining that. It's just little tiny lines to create a shadow. This also applies to this type of work. So you can look through here, get ideas. Look at how they did the fish scales. So all, all these books will really help you to figure out doing this kind of work. You don't have to sit there and reinvent the wheel. I'll let you grab that one. This is another one, Plants and Flowers. And it's similar to the coloring book, but it's more detailed. But it's all using lines to get the idea of the direction that the petals fold, how the curve line gives depth. Uh, hair patterns, you can use hair patterns to show direction without raising parts. Um, and so it's a lot about study these things, look at these things, and it, it, would, it's, it would be great help for you to learn how to do this kind of work. Any questions at all from anybody about anything? Because I think I got done about 20 minutes earlier than I should have. Thank you. And somewhere around here, 
We made a feather last night. So we can donate this as a kit for your auction. And somebody can do their own coloring on it. This is the one we did last night. Yeah. Okay? Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you.